Welcome to Greenable Woodbridge. I'm your host, Carolyn Ehrlich, and today we have a very different topic to talk about, one we have not brought up before, and it's pretty amazing when you think about that we haven't talked about it. And we have Nadine Cadell Sapperman, to, uh, who is our guest. She's involved with Green Faith, which is how I found her, because a good friend, Rob Edgar, from Peak Environmental was talking to me about things that they do with Green Faith, Faith and he sent me a slide presentation that you did on this topic that we'll get into in a minute. And um, you're also very involved with uh, the Citizens Climate Lobby, yes. which is another very important group. So you're, you're a big volunteer. I am. But that is terrific. That really is great. So. Today's topic is um, plant-based diets. And so let's start off with what is a plant-based diet? Sure, so a plant-based diet is when someone intentionally makes choices to eat fruits, vegetables, legumes, beans, nuts, and seeds. Uh, so they are avoiding uh, food that comes from animal products. So before we started talking, when we were just sitting here trying to start to get to know each other, you gave me a statistic that is, I was surprised at. When you talk about impacts on our climate, mm -hmm. where does what we eat, and eating, I guess, animal-based foods, mm -hmm. where does that fall on the causing a problem list. Right, it's pretty high actually for a variety of reasons and we'll talk about what the specific reasons are. Um, the, the resource I was referring to was this book called Drawdown and it addresses ways that we can address climate change specifically. So it's not all environmental impacts but it uh, uh, refers to climate change. And um, this book I found really impactful and the um, the eating a plant-based or plant-rich diet is uh, comes in number four on the Whoa. list in terms of what you can Who do think? to impact the planet. Um, uh -huh. Moving uh, towards a plant plant-rich or plant-based diet is, is really powerful in terms of addressing climate change. So what is it about eating animal-based foods that causes a problem with the climate? So. Um, there's a number of things. The, the highest one is the emissions from, um, how do you put it politely? Um, <laughs> I, was, I was joking yes, with everybody. <laughs> We're going to be talking about how the cows let the air out that's the back. Right, that's right. But it's actually more their belching, oh, okay. um, which, which releases methane. And right. methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas. Um, so animals, uh, in that sense, are, are damaging to the environment for the greenhouse gases that they emit. Uh -huh. uh, there are other environmental impacts as well, and those include with water and land use mm -hmm. and the use of uh, fertilizers. Right. And what about the food the animals eat? What impact does that have on, on that might not be the climate as much as the environment? Well, it's significant actually because really? um, it takes a lot of food to um, to feed those animals so that they can, so that you can then consume them. So it's not efficient at all in terms of resources. You use a lot of water, a lot of land, a lot of fuel for um, creating that food that the animals then eat uh -huh. and then you consume. So the less we eat animal products, the more people you can feed actually. Exactly. And the less land that is used, the less water that is used. It's a, it's a much more efficient in terms of our natural resources, which we want right. to preserve. So if the animals would stop eating our corn, stop <laughs> eating our wheat and the hay, whatever, That's right. then there would be more for people. That's correct. That's correct. And as you may or may not know, I mean, our population has increased tremendously in, on the, in, globally in the past hundred mm -hmm. years. We went from having about a billion and a half people to now we're approaching eight billion people in such a small amount of time right. that puts a lot of um, stress on our natural resources. Mm -hmm. and, and there's so many areas now because of climate change that are having a hard time growing their crops. That's unfortunately true. Right. With so. the extreme weather, the mm -hmm. droughts and the floods that we experience, it's really difficult for farmers and it's only gonna get worse. Right, so save the food for the people. That's right, not save, the, save animals. the animals. That's right, mm -hmm. so, um, What are some other impacts that this has on the environment? 
Right, so if you look at water, for example, water is a really precious resource. Only about three mm percent -hmm. of the water on our planet is fresh water. The rest of it is salt water and is not consumable. So um, when you're when you're using the, that water to feed the animals, it takes away from water that is available to either um, for plants, you know, mm -hmm. to, for people to consume those plants, or for people to drink, and. Um, for an example of that is, it takes about 2,500 gallons of water mm -hmm. to produce one pound of beef. <gasps> oh my gosh, that's incredible. Whereas if you had a pound of wheat, that takes um, 25. So it's about, it's a one hundredth of the amount of water that is necessary for, you know, you to consume the grain Right. That rather than the meat that would it would, would require for to to have that meat. So it's so fascinating. You just don't think about these things. Right. Yeah. Producing um, animals for food is very very intensive on water and beef especially. Mm -hmm. um, beef and lamb are the highest. In the worst. Of, yeah, they are. Yeah, both in terms of water and especially in terms of carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. So if something, you know, if somebody said, oh, I don't want to move t to a fully plant-based diet, you can go in steps. And mm -hmm. one significant step that people can take is to eliminate beef and, and cow products from their, from mm -hmm. their diets. Because milk is also very, very water intensive. Right. And people may not realize that. It takes about a thousand gallons of water through the entire process to create one gallon of milk. <gasps> Oh my gosh, that's so crazy. alternatives like rice milk, soy milk, oat milk, even almond milk, which is pretty water intensive in itself, mm -hmm. are all much better than cow's milk. Very, very interesting. Oh my goodness. So um, we're talking about plant-based. Mm -hmm. Is that the same as vegetarian and or vegan or? Right. So there's a lot of um, names for eating a plant-based diet. If you're strictly plant-based and you eat only things that come from plants, that would be considered vegan, mm -hmm. right? A lot of people uh, adopt a vegetarian diet where they would also have in their diet eggs, milk, cheese, and so forth. Right. So animals that, um, not eating the flesh of the animal itself, but some, something that is derived from an animal. But uh, I'm just throwing this out there. I don't know if you know the answer. Would uh, a real, I guess, purist, would they not wear leather or, or things made from animals? Yes. So a, um, there's a difference between a vegan diet and uh -huh. a vegan lifestyle, uh -huh. right? So I know plenty of people who have a, maintained a vegan diet where they eat only uh, foods that come from plants, but they will have leather shoes or they will have down jackets or down mm -hmm. pillows or other things that come from animals. But I also know a couple of people who are strict vegans mm -hmm. and they adopt that as a way of life mm -hmm. who really shy away from any using anything that comes from animals. Right, right. So but we're not asking folks to do that. No, no. <laughs> if they want to, I mean, they can. But. But, but there are steps that people can take. So if I said to you, you know, I, I'm, I'm not ready to be totally a vegetarian yet. I understand what you're saying, right. but um, so what are, are things that I can do as steps to getting there? Right. Well, lots of strategies. Uh, what some folks do is, uh, I don't know if you've heard of the term meatless Mondays, uh -huh. but there's this whole movement for meatless Mondays where people will pick a day of the week, Monday is just an example, and they will eat um, plant-based on that day only. Mm -hmm. But that, then one-seventh of the days they're not having animal products, and that's, that's a great that's contribution. That's a big difference, right. What some other folks will do is they'll eat vegan or plant-based before six o'clock. So they'll have their breakfast, their lunch, their snacks being vegan. And then at dinner, they might have chicken or fish or something like that. Mm -hmm. And that too has a significant impact if you're These making that choice. Hints. Very yep. good. Um, something that I did when I was moving towards you know this, um, this type of lifestyle myself was I would eat vegetarian out when I was in a restaurant so I could mm -hmm. kind of figure out what kinds of foods I liked. Mm -hmm. And then I would learn, you know, teach myself how to cook those same things at home. Because for me, what to cook at home was the obstacle. Mm -hmm. Eating out was fine. I could always find something vegetarian or vegan on a menu, but I didn't know how to feed my family. That is interesting. So that was what I did. Uh, yeah, and one of the things that you told me before the show was that you actually use children's cookbooks to, because they're the easiest 
recipe. That's exactly right. And I'm not ashamed <laughs> to say it. You have to start somewhere. Right. I wasn't starting, you know, with uh, some highfalutin uh, chef. I, w I would go to the library and get, uh, you know, kids' cookbooks. Right. And it, it, it gave me a foundation where I could feel successful and then build from there. Right, right. And there's so many cookbooks for kids that how do you get your kids to eat vegetables right. and things like that, camouflaging the food. And uh, so, that, so that is really, really exciting. Um, so before we close out, we've got a few minutes left. I just would love for you to talk a little bit about Green Faith and the work you've done with them. Sure. So Green Faith is an international organization that takes um, folks from different faith communities and unites them to do work for the environment. And I've been in our local Green Faith circle, it's called, for about two years. Um, we get together every other month and we are different communities of faith, right? So there in our, in our Green Faith circle, there we have a Catholic church, there's a Jewish temple, there's a Reformed church, a Unitarian church, a Presbyterian church, and all these people get together, uh, a couple representatives from each congregation, and we talk about actions we will take. So we might have a, a movie screening, we do a river cleanup. Right now we're doing this traveling road show of um, each congregation came up with an environmental action and we're taking that to all of the other oh, groups to teach I them. I love that. That is great. Well, you, you could be sure Woodbridge is going to be having some green face circles. Great. So, uh, yeah, that is a great. So, anyways, we have about one minute left. So, what message or what words would you like to conclude this show with? Mm. That moving towards a plant-based diet is something anyone can do. You don't have to do it, you know, full bore, but any steps that you can take to reduce your consumption of animal products would help the environment in terms of carbon emissions, use of water, land use, and more. That is, you know, this has been so informative. I do these shows once a month, and this is really a show that people can learn from. And, and actually, I always say that um, it's one step at a time. And that's, that's right. very much the approach that you're giving us here. Just take a little step. That's Just right, like take give a little us step. One day a week. Yeah. Because everything at the end of the day makes a difference. It matters. Your choices so, matter. Yep, yep. So thank you so much for coming in and, um, and for being such a great volunteer for the climate. <laughs> thank you. We it's need my more passion. people like you. <laughs> thank you. Welcome back to Greenable Woodbridge. Our second half of the show is about rain gardens. And the reason why we're talking about them now is because it's almost spring and everybody's going to be talking about planting. So we're going to find out how you can plant a rain garden in your own backyard, or I guess in your front yard. So with us today is Thomas Flynn, who works in the engineering department, and he is our certified floodplain manager. But before we start talking about rain gardens, so the, the, the floodplain management and the certification process was an awful lot of work, <laughs> but FEMA said, we're good to go, and there are steps, and you did such a good job <laughs> you, in following their plan and doing what we needed to do that for those of you who have flood insurance, when you get your bill on May 1st, you can thank Tom because your bill is going to be, there's going to be a savings of 20%. Correct. And for some of you, that's an <laughs> awful lot of money. And he hasn't stopped working. And he's hoping, what are you hoping for next year? Right, so the plan is to keep growing the, the, the program, right? Uh -huh. so, so right now we're at 20%. Uh, the average policy in town is actually $4,000 a year. Wow. So that's pretty significant savings. It is. Um, you know, so we're at a class six in the community rating system. So FEMA's program uh, under the National Flood Insurance Program, um, it, it, uh, you know, it credits towns that go above and beyond, right? So the CRS program is above the minimum standards of the NFIP. Um, and they say, you know, because you've done that, you know, here's this discount on flood insurance policies in the town. Um, so we're class six now, which correlates to a 20 percent, um, mm -hmm. and we're going to shoot, you know, higher, five, four, three, you know, just keep calling. There we keep so. going, keep saving people money. Absolutely. That's so important. And, and right. aside from saving money, we're actually doing things right. that will help with controlling us 
from flooding. Right, becoming more resilient, right? right. So it's and it's and it's great because there's 96 different elements of the CRS program. So it's mm -hmm. a, it's everything from outreach, so stuff you'll see on TV 35 that helps educate homeowners. We can count this a little bit. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, and also, you know, there the outreach events that we give in public, mm -hmm. um, as well as what we do to manage uh, stormwater and site plans and everything right trickling down to rain gardens. Right, and here we are right, right. at rain gardens. Right. So. Um, I always say, Tom, you walk around Town Hall <laughs> with a smile on your face all the time. You're one of the happiest <laughs> people I know. And I think it's because you are passionate about the work you do. And, and one of the things you're passionate about is the fact that we have been building rain gardens throughout the township. So why don't you start there with what a rain garden is, sure. what it does, and um, how we've been building them all over. Absolutely. So, you know, what I love about rain gardens, right, so to, to, to start off there, right, so when we think about managing pollution, so when we think back to uh, all of the, the federal regulations that happened in the 70s to, you know, stop the illicit discharge of pollution into our waterways, that was, that was a specific point source, right, so we knew mm -hmm. that there was pollution problems into our waterways and we stopped big, big businesses from, from doing that. Um, but one of the things that we've kind of evolved with over time is how do we deal with non-point non -point source pollution, right? So pollution that comes into our waterways from a, a variety of different sources uh, that we have trouble regulating and we have trouble kind of getting at. Um, so what that means is, so you know, when you see that car in front of you, you know, trickle a little bit of oil from its from its uh, gas tank or mm -hmm. or from its muffler, or you know, you happen to see that you know there might be some trash on the roadway that you know just so happens to get caught up in a catch basin, those are non-point source pollution, right? So these these areas that we have trouble regulating and trouble you know kind of identifying where there are problems. That's where rain gardens are so important in trying to get at what we can do to manage not only stormwater runoff, but manage, uh, you know, the pollutants that go into our water bodies. Right. So, you know, what's just great about the, water, the all, all the work that we're doing in town is that, you know, we've started it at the libraries, right? So we've started it at mm -hmm. education level. So mm -hmm. at, you know, getting at what it me what these rain gardens are. So they're not just, you know, uh, these structures that are designed for a specific level of, of water infiltration, they also have native plants. They're great for groundwater recharge. As Nadine mentioned, it's so important to think about water quality benefits mm -hmm. over time. Um, you know, and then in addition to that, we also have these, you know, these beautiful signs now at, 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 at the, the libraries that help educate folks about what they are. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you know, it's, it's just wonderful to, to really get at a source of education which can help, you know, really galvanize the troops moving forward and the kids and, 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 and help them understand how important these things are and how we can take them to our backyards and our front right. yards. So how do we take it to our backyards? <laughs> <laughs> right, so, these, so the best way to describe a rain garden, right, it's an impervious disconnection. So it's, you know, the downspouts that you see in, in every kind of structure, right, so it, it manages the roof runoff, mm -hmm. which, you know, carries with it its own pollutants. And then it flows typically right into the roadway, right. uh, which is, you know, that's how we've adapted over time as, mm -hmm. as, a, as a society, not just as a municipality. So uh, what we do now is we, we look at the, the drainage area, so we look at the roof, right, mm -hmm. typically, or, or driveway or a, a roadway or a parking lot, like here in Town Hall. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we, we, we disconnect the impervious surface. So we, we realign the downspout directly into a, a structure that's been designed and engineered to manage that specific drainage area. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and it's so important to think about the soil texture and the soil amendments. So like here in town, we all know, you know, we, were, we have a lot of clay, clay right? right? And that's the history of the town. Um, so, you know, thinking about things like that and adding the appropriate texture and the appropriate amendments mm -hmm. uh, in order to design it properly, um, is key to success, right? So, um, and our partners at, at Rutgers have helped us tremendously mm -hmm. in order to do that. Um, and folks that have questions about how to specifically design their own and create their own, you know, we, we now have the resources here in Town Hall to help them do that. Right. So, let's go back to Town Hall. So, before when it rained, the water just flowed right into the street. There was no stopping it. Right. We put in, I guess, curb cuts. Right. And so, and, and some piping. Right. And so now the water changes direction, 
goes into the rain garden, right. and then what happens to it? Right, so the, the, the water is, is designed now to flow into that, that structure in, in the middle of the parking lot by the flagpole. Um, and basically it's designed to, to pond there, you know, so if, if you see ponding water for up to 12 to even 24 hours sometimes, it's mm -hmm. okay. You know, we're... That's we, the purpose. It's the purpose. So it, the plants that have been, uh, you know, chosen for that location love wet conditions, right? Mm -hmm. And if it does get too high, there is that overflow pipe, right? So there's an overflow pipe at, at the at a specific location within the structure where when the water gets too high, the pipe says, okay, I'll take the rest of anything that the, the structure can't hold anymore, uh -huh. and it kicks it out to the street. So Very eventually, at some point, these structures can't handle Superstorm Sandy. They're not mm -hmm. designed for that. But they can handle that first inch Absolutely. of rain. Absolutely, right. Which sometimes it's that first inch that causes all the problems. Absolutely. You don't need a Sandy. Absolutely, right. So it, and like, like Nadine said, it's the small steps, right? right. So, and the more, the more folks that start taking these small steps and think about what we can do on our own properties to help manage stormwater, mm -hmm. the better off our waterways are going to be. Okay, so I want to put one in my backyard. What's the first thing I should do? <laughs> well, the, the, the first thing, you know, is to kind of just give a, a basic assessment of the site, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it's, rain gardens aren't actually the best uh, for already wet conditions. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, first, that always rule <laughs> my yard out. <laughs> so, you know, always, always call before you dig, right? Uh -huh. And if you don't know what that means, um, you know, check in with the engineering department or the building department. There are specific numbers to call where you can have the utility lines uh, all marked out so you're not going to have any disruptions there. Mm -hmm. um, and in addition to that, take a look at your house, right? So if you have a basement, you really don't want a rain garden within 10 feet of the house mm -hmm. or the foundational walls because, you know, if, if the structure does overflow, if it's not designed properly, or if we just get another superstorm sandy, mm -hmm. you know, unfortunately, if it's too close to, to a house or a basement, you know, you could pose some kind of problem there. Right. Um, and then if you have trees, you know, you certainly don't want to disrupt the, the, the tree roots, mm -hmm. right? But if you do have a relatively flat yard, right, and you're, and you're thinking about, you know, what do I do with the, the, the drainage area that just seems to just flow right into the wall, right right into the roadway, mm -hmm. um, or right down my sidewalk, and it causes icing in the winter, and it, you know, mm -hmm. and all I do is throw I, uh, is throw salt, and then you know that poses a problem for for, for water conveyance and for the, the water bodies. What can I do, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where a rain garden comes into uh -huh. effect. So it's it's really having a, a thought out process, right? And then you you then you can start to design it, and that's the fun part. That's interesting. So, does it make more sense to put it in the front yard than the backyard? Well, they're they're aesthetically pleasing. They're mm -hmm. they're beautiful structures, right? So typically they're planted with native flowers, so like purple like cone flower, uh, black eyed susans, mm -hmm. uh, cool. goldenrod, uh, uh -huh. switch grasses. So these these beautiful flowers that you know. The, 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 the wettest of flowers, like butterfly milkweed, should really be at the base and the low point where mm -hmm. it's wet, right? right? But, you know, you can have fun with this and design your own um, and just kind of, you know, create this mosaic of different colors and really, you know, throw some rocks in there and, and around the edges to define the edges mm -hmm. um, and just have a beautiful feature for your property that, you know, other folks aren't, aren't really... Uh, can't say they have yet, anyway. Right. And, and, and it's, it's neat and pretty. It doesn't look like a bunch of weeds. Right. I, well, and, and that's and that's important, right? Because over time, these these do require some maintenance, right? So mm -hmm. so weeds will try to kind of poke their way in. You know, uh -huh. they'll try to be, you know, the the first ones to get the nutrients in the spring. Mm -hmm. So you know, by being able to identify what plant is what, you'll be able to know how to pull that weed mm -hmm. and how to keep the milkweed. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, it, and, and, and once they flower, they are so beautiful, you uh -huh. know, between the yellows and the purples, it, 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 it really is beautiful. Do you get butterflies? It, right. So a lot of times these are called butterfly gardens, right? Uh -huh. So the, the, the difference is really in the engineering and the way you manage the stormwater. Mm -hmm. um, these plants are, are attractive for pollinating insects, like, like nice. butterflies. Yeah, That's good. Absolutely. That's Absolutely. better than having palms where you're pollinating mosquitoes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. That's definitely better. Absolutely. So, um, so this is actually, though, an engineered garden. Yes. It, unlike, you know, where you just do landscaping regularly, right. it's, you know, you plant whatever you like wherever you want. Right. This is engineered. So what are it the is. different parts of the... So, so, you know, it's important to look at the slope, right? So the, mm -hmm. the, the, the rise over run, you know, uh -huh. and go back to the, the elementary school, uh, you know, uh, mathematics and, and to look at the slope there. Uh, typically, the slope on the, 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 the berm of the rain garden is between 4% uh -huh. 
to a maximum of about 10%. And if you, any folks ever have any you know, interest or, or question as to what that means and they want to get their hands dirty, you know, there are ways yeah. to actually do that and have a string on either wow. side of a post. Well, cool. And you, know, you, you, you kind of feel like um, it, it, you're, you're experimenting, but uh, in, in a fun way, right? So um, in, a, in, in, in a very pragmatic uh, manner that the, the engineering department is, is, is happy to, to help, uh, you know, along in that process. So for for people who live in Woodbridge who love gardening anyway, right. they should be doing this Absolutely. because this is a great project. Absolutely. Um, I don't necessarily fall in that category, <laughs> but, but for somebody who is used to it, this is something. And I don't know if you know this off the top of your head, but if you don't, we'll put it on the bottom of the screen. Sure. Rutgers has a great website sure. for building rain gardens. Sure. The, the, the Water Resources Program, mm -hmm. I, I don't know the specific URL, so, oh, so right. we will defer to that, uh, that, that little crawler. But um, yes, the Water Resources Program is incredible. Um, mm -hmm. Dr. Chris Abrupta has been incredible helping us. I know he's been a, a guest. Uh, um, right. And he's provided us with a lot of materials uh, to be able to help uh, all, all the folks in town. Right, right. And they should reach out to um, them anyways because sometimes they'll give out grants if right. you're doing I think there is a program right now yep. where they'll give you a grant toward building your rain garden right right so I, I, I know in the past they've, they've been able to help folks and in, in terms of if you know they have any uh, you know p possible phys uh, physical handicaps and they don't you know they can't actually get their hands dirty and dig mm -hmm. the garden themselves but maybe they can plant it's just you know moving that soil around is, is tough right. um, so you know sometimes they, they will be able to reimburse that Wow yeah that so they, they have they have a lot of great programs and we're very lucky to work with them Terrific. okay I think we have about one minute or less. So how would you wrap this up? What would your <laughs> last comment be? You know, I think um, we don't see a lot of uh, rain gardens yet on, on um, private property, right? Uh, mm -hmm. we, we do see so many now on municipal property, right? right. On our libraries, on town hall. Um, but because, you know, uh, last year marked the ninth year that uh, Woodbridge has won mm -hmm. uh, the, the Sustainable Jersey Champions in the, in the large municipality category. Uh, I can only see people jumping on board with this. Um, it's just going to make sense for stormwater. It's going to make sense for their properties, and it's going to make sense for the habitat that they help. Right. Thank you. And and I'm sure if they have any questions, you're always happy to help our residents Absolutely. and give them advice. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, thank you for being on this show. Thanks for having and, me. And um, you're going to be giving me advice on my rain garden. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. And thank you for watching Greenable Woodbridge and being part of the change and part of the excitement.